everyone. I'm Linda Black Elk. I'm the Food Sovereignty Coordinator at United Tribes Technical College, which is the tribal college in Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, most of you might not be familiar with the tribal college system, but it's basically um, an organization of colleges and universities for the most part that are on reservations within um, the United States and a few in Canada. Um, United Tribes, where I teach, is actually off the reservation, but we still serve our local tribal communities here in North Dakota. So I have a really multicultural student population made up of Ojibwe students, Lakota students, Dakotas, um, uh, Mandans, Hidatsas, and Arikaras. And I'd just like to say that I'm currently sitting on the traditional homelands of the Lakota people and also the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples. So thanks so much for joining me today. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you about plants. I'm an ethnobotanist, and that is just basically a big word for someone who teaches about the relationship between people and plants. And um, I'm going to share some of that knowledge uh, that I've gained from elders and other knowledge holders. None of this knowledge is my own. It's all been shared with me. And so I'm super honored to be able to share that with you all. So I'm just going to share my screen here so that we can get started. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the healing power of plants, and we have a little activity that I wanted to do with you all, and that is to make an excellent cup of tea, um, one that's going to be relaxing and healing for you. Um, this is one of my favorite tea blends because it has so many applications, and you can just keep it around all year long. Um, <laughs> as you notice, um, I talk about the healing power of plants, but I also tell you that a lot of these plants I'm going to be talking about probably grow in the cracks of your driveway, um, right outside the door of your office. Uh, these are really common plants that some people might even call weeds, but, um, you know, I wouldn't call them. Uh, the, uh, them weeds because to me they are amazing foods and medicines. Um, so yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> so the first plant um, that I wanted to talk to you about, and actually one of the plants that I asked you to maybe have on hand when we started visiting, are rose hips. And so if you see me, I have some beautiful dried rose hips here, um, and I've already taken the seeds out. Um, and I'll tell you why I did that in a second, but these are these are dried, air dried rose hips. Um, uh, wild rose is such an amazing plant, um, but the information I'm gonna share with you is actually applicable to all of your cultivated roses as well. As long as you don't spray them with herbicides, pesticides, or fungicides, um, you can utilize the roses uh, and the rose bushes that grow outside of your home or outside of your office building or you know the ones that maybe grow in your local city park as long as they haven't been sprayed. Um, wild roses actually get, um, they have a beautiful flower first of all that you can see in the bottom left hand corner where my arrow is pointing here. Gorgeous little usually pink flowers, sometimes white, sometimes yellow. Um, have that beautiful rose fragrance that really unfortunately has been bred out of like our Valentine's roses, you know, those cultivated roses that you might get in a florist shop. shop. Um, unfortunately, those have actually had the smell bred out of them. And I think that that's half of the reason to love roses. The other half of the reason to love roses is that they also get these gorgeous um, as you can see in the bottom right hand photo, they get these gorgeous fruits that we call rose hips. I don't know why they're called rose hips, um, but that is the name for the rose berries that, that grow on the rose bush. Um, uh, I have on my screen here also the Lakota names just to honor my family. Um, my husband and my children are all enrolled members of the Standing Rock and Cheyenne River Lakota Nations. And um, so I put the Lakota names up for many of these plants. For instance, um, in Lakota, Wild Rose is known as Unjijint Kahu. Um, and that is actually also, interestingly enough, the name for tomatoes. Um, and I think it's because these cute little rose hips look a little bit like a grape or cherry tomato. 
um, but they taste very different. Rose hips taste like a cross between a cranberry and an apple. They're absolutely delicious. But what's more is they are chock full of vitamin C. Um, and more vitamin C than almost any other fruit in the world. Even the citruses don't have as much vitamin C as rose hips do. Um, why do we care about rose hips? Um, why do we care about vitamin C? Um, vitamin C actually boosts our immune system and helps us to fight off infections. So for example, if you're about to go through surgery, um, I always have the people I work with drink rose hip tea for an entire week before surgery and enti an entire week after. And numerous studies have shown that that consumption of the, the rose hip tea will actually help to reduce post-surgical infections significantly. Um, but making tea isn't the only way to consume a rose hip. As you can see in that top right hand photo, um, I have a beautiful rose hip muffin. Uh, you want to make sure to remove the seeds, but then you can use the um, red fruity part of the rose hip just like you would any other fruit. Um, and of course, um, on the left there, I have some rose hip infused vinegar that is fantastic for salad dressings or any other um, dishes that you want to add a little bit of acid to. Um, but today we're actually going to be using rose hips to make some tea uh, for our tea blend. Now, why do I ask that you remove the seeds from the rose hip? If you've ever broken a rose hip open, the seeds are covered in tiny little sharp hairs. And there are actually numerous sort of like uncomfortable stories about what happens when you eat too many rose hips and you haven't removed the seeds. Um, uh, you can have some discomfort later, if you know what I mean, by consuming too many of those little sharp hairs. So make sure to just scoop the little um, seeds out and you'll get almost all the hairs out and you'll be totally fine. Now, if you um, have a lot of rose hips that are already dried and they still have the seeds in them, don't despair. You can still utilize those for tea. Um, you can boil those rose hips up um, or in, um, you know, steep them in hot water. And then um, you can just pour your tea through a coffee filter or an old t-shirt or some cheesecloth to filter those little hairs out okay so no big deal um, but if you're going to eat them like in the muffin for example uh, you'll need to remove those seeds so don't ever forget about the amazing healing power of rose hips their high vitamin C content and how they can boost our immune system to fight off infections. Um, that uh, actually applies, as I said, to surgical, post-surgical infections. It also applies to things like um, pneumonia. If you're someone who's prone to lung infections, you know you think you've, you've only caught a little cold, but you end up with pneumonia or bronchitis, drinking rose hip tea every day at the onset of symptoms can help to prevent those infections. So fantastic uh, plant to have around. Another plant that I asked you to have with you is the um, universal dandelion. <laughs> Everyone knows what a dandelion looks like, right? Um, it's just something that grows a lot in our yards and our gardens. Um, some of you may have even tried to spray the dandelions out of your lawn. And I always think that's such a shame because um, dandelions are such an amazing food and an amazing medicine. That was actually the original reason that they were grown in the first place. Um, but somehow dandelions have become vilified because of this Western notion that we have to have a perf perfectly green, smooth lawn. That's a total monoculture. Um, and that actually you know, just isn't something that should exist in nature. We embrace our dandelions, the dandelions that grow in our lawn. We love them because we know and understand them. Um, so dandelions are like that relative, um, you know, you may not always want to be in communication with them, but they're still always there when you need them. Um, <laughs> uh, the whole dandelion is edible and medicinal. So um, for example, we collect those beautiful yellow dandelion blossoms in the summer um, and we freeze them. Um, sometimes we'll dry them too, but we usually freeze them and um, we'll have this gorgeous bag of yellow dandelion flowers in our freezer. And then during the coldest, most gray part of the winter months, 
I'll pull that out and I'll boil those up and make some beautiful dandelion flower tea. It has the aroma and the flavor of honey. And I'll even add a little extra honey in there for some sweetness for my kids. Um, and it's also, you know, yellow, uh, the flower um, uh, tea from dandelion flowers actually helps to boost your mood and boost your um uh, uh, you know, it, some people who have maybe seasonal affective disorder, things like that, dandelion flower tea helps to boost your mood. And it also makes a delicious tea. You can also use those same dandelion flowers in things like um, your zucchini bread recipes, and they add a beautiful burst of yellow color in there. Um, and, and they're fantastically flavorful and sweet and delicious. Uh, dandelion stems are edible. Sometimes uh, to make a low carb spaghetti, we'll actually get a lot of long dandelion stems and we will blanch them and add them to our spaghetti noodles um, to make sort of a half regular spaghetti and half dandelion spaghetti. Um, and we just put the same you know, spaghetti sauce over the top, but we have something with half of the carbs that we would normally have. It's fantastic. And my kids don't even notice the difference. Um, Dandelion leaves are totally edible and medicinal. Um, uh, I've asked you to have some uh, dandelion leaves with you today. I actually have some dried dandelion leaves in this bowl. Uh, beautiful, um, dried them earlier this spring. Um, simply just harvest them, lay them out on some paper towels, put a fan on them if you need to, and they'll be dried in a matter of a couple of days. Um, but dandelion leaves are fantastic in salad. If you see in the bottom left-hand corner, that's actually some sauteed dandelion greens that have been cooked up in a little bacon fat. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite things. I always say bacon is the great equalizer and you can cook anything in bacon grease and it'll taste pretty good. <laughs> um, in the top left-hand corner, those are actually dandelion flowers uh, that have been fried, dipped in a little cornmeal, and then again, fried in some bacon grease. Um, they're super delicious as well. And in the bottom right hand corner, we actually have some dried dandelion root. Now, some of you may have had dandelion coffee before, which is a fantastic coffee substitute made from roasted dried dandelion roots. Um, dandelion root coffee is fantastic. It's decaf and it has the flavor of chocolate and caramel. It's wonderful. Um, but did you know that dandelion root is also an amazing medicine, just like the leaves? Dandelion helps to lower and stabilize blood sugar. Um, it helps to lift your mood if you're um, not feeling, uh, uh, you know, if you're having a little bit of stress or anxiety, dandelion will help to lift your mood. It's um, also fantastic and is being used. Uh, it's super high in antioxidant and uh, antioxidants and is being used to treat numerous types of cancer. You can actually look up really fantastic articles about the fact that dandelion helps to shrink tumors um, and also helps to get people through chemo much more easily. So it's a fantastic tea um, to give to people who may be experiencing cancer. Um, so, you know, just a wonderful medicine. And it's amazing to me that we vilify it so much and get rid of it because it's it's there, you know, it's always there for us and it just has such a multitude of uses. So we'll be adding um, the, those uh, dandelion leaves to our beautiful tea blend today. Um, the other, uh, the last plant that I asked you all to have with you was some wild mint or some mint, maybe just some of the mint from your garden. Maybe you collect wild mint like we do. Um, it's a very important traditional uh, plant and ceremonial medicine uh, here in the Dakotas for many indigenous people here. So we collect wild mint, this uh, one that's on the left side of your screen, Mintha arvensis. We collect that every year. But if you have um, a bunch of catnip growing in your yard or garden, gather that and dry it to it. It's, it's also a wonderful medicine, even though it's extremely common. I actually do have catnip growing in the cracks of my driveway. Um, it just grows everywhere around here. Um, and you know, I'm always thankful for it because it's such a wonderful medicine. And I actually have some um, uh, that I collected this spring. So I have a bowl of dried catnip right here. Um, 
all that beautiful minty aroma. I, I just love it. But a lot of people don't know that mint and all the mint family, um, I'm someone who has asthma. So I drink mint tea regularly to strengthen my lungs and keep them clear. Um, all of the mint family actually helps to loosen up congestion, whether it's in the sinuses or the lungs, and it helps us to, to, you know, it thins that stuff up to help us get it out more effectively. So it works as an expectorant, um, but also it helps to strengthen our lungs so that we can fight off infections um, and we can fight off those asthma attacks. Um, if you're someone who's prone to allergies, the mint family is great for you. And of course, again, as, as many of you probably know, mint is super relaxing, okay? Um, so I actually, I'm gonna show you guys how I make my tea blends and it's the easiest thing in the world. This is a very simple tea blend to make because it's equal parts of each plant, about a quarter of a cup, okay? Um, and I'm not one to measure super carefully, but I have my jar right here and I'm gonna take my dried rose hips and just pour them into the jar. Try not to make as much of a mess as I'm making now, <laughs> but um, get it into your jar. Um, the catnip, pour that into your jar. And our dandelion leaves into the jar. I have all three of them in there. You can use any size jar you want. Normally I make much larger blends, so I usually use a quart jar like this, but it's totally up to you. It's just equal parts. Then I'm just gonna close it up and give it a shake. And voila, we have an amazing tea blend right here that's going to boost our immune system, strengthen our lungs. Uh, it's gonna help us relax and be able to meet the world. I have this in the morning, I have it in the evening. Um, there's no caffeine in it. Uh, so it's it's just really wonderful. I have it in the middle of, of the day at work. It's it's just, oh, and it's delicious because the rose hips are in there, giving it that beautiful sweetness. Um, the mint is in there, uh, you know, adding that gorgeous flavor in there, the catnip. Um, and then the dandelion leaves are in there to, to boost our mute, mood and um, help us to uh, boost our immune system as well. Um, now, I wanted to say that dandelion, uh, and I didn't say this earlier, is actually fantastic for your liver. So if you've ever been told that you're at risk of fatty liver disease, um, start incorporating dandelion tea into your diet every day. Okay, it's, it's good to, to, to incorporate into your diet every day. Or for those of my sisters out there who travel a lot, um, have you ever been on a plane for a few hours and your lower legs end up getting a little swollen? You have a little bit of edema in your lower legs. Um, you can actually uh, drink dandelion root tea and it'll help to get rid of that excess liquid uh, because dandelion can actually be um, mildly diuretic. So you wanna make sure to drink lots of fresh water as well. Um, but yeah, this is the tea blend uh, for you. I think it's such a great one to have around. So let me show you you now how I'm going to make the perfect cup of tea. First of all, there are all kinds of tools you can use to make the perfect cup of tea. Um, if you, um, you know, go online or in some of your local tea shops, you might see one of these. Isn't that a gorgeous little um, tea strainer? And it makes everything so easily because you can just put that down into your jar and scoop up about two teaspoons of your tea blend have my tea blend in there, about two teaspoons, and you'll just add that into your teacup and pour your hot water over it. Isn't that wonderful? It's that easy. And you don't have any um, tea bag to throw away. So those are great. Uh, they, they come in all different forms, those uh, tea strainers. They come as a tea ball like this that opens up. It has a little locking mechanism. So you can put your tea blend right in there close it up, lock it, and then it has a hook on the end of the chain that will actually hook your tea mug or your coffee mug or your teacup, you know, whatever you have. So it'll hook on there and it'll stay on there, right? So those are great. Um, you'll also find some that have these little cool little designs up at the top. 
this as a leaf someone gave it to me you know because it's plant related it's cool but this is a tea strainer do you see those little holes in there um so what you can do here is actually put your tea blend in here and use it exactly like you would any other tea strainer put it in your mug pour your hot water in and when you're done steeping your tea just pull it out. I usually steep my tea for about 10 to 15 minutes. Isn't that great? So I'm actually, um, uh, before I talk to you more, I'm gonna actually make myself a cup of tea. I put about two teaspoons of my tea blend in here, okay? And I'm going to add it to my mug. Then I'm gonna pour my hot water over it. Beautiful. Okay, and now I'm just gonna let this steep for probably about 10 to 15 minutes um, so that I can drink it and have a really great, healthy day, relaxing day. Um, while that's steeping, I wanna talk to you about a few more plants that are really common and ones that you can um, find around your, your yard, your home, your office, um, wherever you live. So this is one of my favorites. Um, have you ever been walking, you know, maybe near a wetland, you know, maybe you live near a pond or a lake and there are cattails everywhere. Most people know what a cattail looks like. Um, if you've ever been doing that and you see a beautiful purple flower, um, spike flower growing in and among the cattails, maybe you've seen blue vervain before. Um, this is one of my most important self-care plants, you guys. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not like it's like a, a powerful anti-anxiety herb, or it's not like it's like a powerful de-stressing herb. The way that I describe the feeling that blue vervain gives me is that, um, you know, when anytime I'm feeling like off center, right, you know, I'm just feeling a little like, okay, things just aren't right. I'm having a, a nervous or stressful day, or I just don't know how I'm going to get through this day kind of day. Um, I will drink blue vervain tea. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'll even add it to the tea blend that I just made with you all. Um, so what I'll do is I, I'll collect the leaves or the flowers or both. Um, I'll dry them and then, um, you know, I'll, I'll add them to any of my tea blends. And I always say that anytime I'm just feeling a little bit off, it just helps to bring me back to the center. And I'm able to say to myself, okay, I got this. I can handle this, right? This is my, you know, I, I can handle this tea. Uh, and, and, you know, bl blue vervain is super safe. Um, I even give it to kids who maybe um, are having a bad day or like when one of my kids has a major exam coming up and they're really nervous and they've been up studying and they're really stressed out. I give them blue vervain tea because it's such a wonderful, safe, gentle tea um, to always have around. So blue vervain, don't forget about that one. Um, I also wanted to talk about hops um, and that beautiful Lakota name, Cha'iyue, uh, which means that it climbs and circles around things um, because uh, uh, hops grows as a vine. Um, and it gets these beautiful little paper, light, uh, like lantern looking flowers on them that you can see in these photos um, and drawings. Um, and it's very, very common. It's probably growing on a fence in your neighborhood and you don't even know it. <laughs> um, but this is my go-to if I'm experiencing, you know, I'm having a really tough week or a tough time um, and I'm experiencing some insomnia. I'm not able to sleep well. Um, and, and that happens to me really often uh, to where, you know, I just, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, I, I'm going to have to be up for a seven o'clock meeting over Zoom. And, you know, I really need to try to get another hour or two of sleep. What I'll do is I will actually get up, put some hops into some hot water, let it steep for just a few minutes and drink that tea and I'm able to go right back to bed. Um, I've had friends with really, really terrible insomnia who've had it for years. Um, they try their first cup of hops tea and they say, oh my gosh, you know, I've, I've found it. I found the thing that's gonna help me sleep. And you know, uh, very often, once you get back into a better sleep cycle, you don't even have to drink the hops tea anymore. Um, sometimes if I'm feeling really stressed and really off kilter, I'll actually mix that blue vervain with um, the, the wild hops and they make a fantastic tea combination, okay? 
So that's a really fun one to have around. Um, chickweed, I really love to talk about this one because it's so common in people's gardens and lawns. You'll just see it kind of creeping everywhere and you'll see that beautiful teeny tiny little star flower like you see in the top left-hand corner. You've probably had this in your flower beds and you didn't even know that it's an amazing um, edible plant that you can actually chop up and you know make some chickweed fritters like we did up here. Um, or uh, much, you know, more interestingly, you can actually make chickweed oil. You can buy it. It's a little bit expensive online. And I've never understood why people would choose to buy chickweed oil rather than make it. Um, but maybe you don't live in an area where chickweed grows, or maybe you don't live, um, you know, in an area where you feel safe harvesting it, um, or you haven't learned to identify plants completely yet, and you need a little bit of uh, time and identification assistance. That's totally fine. You can actually go to a number of vendors online, or you can go to your local herb shop, and you can find some chickweed. Now, why would you want to use use chickweed oil. Chickweed oil is my go-to oil um, when people have issues uh, with fibroids. Now they can be fibroids um, like fibrocystic breast tissue, or maybe you have a fibroid on your ovary or your uterus that's bothering you. Um, uh, or that's causing some pain, that's causing some inflammation, maybe that's even causing some fertility issues. Um, chickweed oil has been shown to shrink fibroids and fibrocystic breast tissue significantly. It's a wonderful, wonderful oil to keep around. Um, all you have to do is add a cup or two of chickweed to a crock pot, pour some olive oil over to it, um, over top of it. So let's say if you were using two cups of chickweed, you would use four cups, like double the amount of oil, um, just, you know, like some good olive oil, doesn't have to be extra virgin, but I always like to use organic olive oil. Um, and then put that in a crock pot and let it sit overnight. And then in the morning, turn it off, strain it, and you have chickweed oil. That's all it is. Okay, that's, that's all it is. It's chickweed, olive oil in a crock pot overnight, strained, and you got it. And that's fantastic. You could do six to 10 drops three or four times a day, super safe, super easy, um, and you can also eat it. <laughs> okay. Um, another plant that many of you have probably seen growing around really commonly um, is pineapple weed. A lot of people actually know this as wild chamomile. And did you know that we actually have wild chamomile growing all around us? It'll have these, um, you know, it drops its petals very quickly. It'll have little white petals, but it drops them very quickly and leaves these cute little um, yellow cones everywhere. And it grows down very close to the ground. You won't normally see it taller than a few inches tall, um, but it has a gorgeous smell. If you pinch that little yellow cone um, and smell it, it actually smells like fresh cut pineapple. And it has the most beautiful pineapple scent um, that you can drink as a tea. You know, it has the same uh, relax relaxation properties that you get from uh, cultivated chamomile tea. But, um, you know, this is a beautiful wild one with much more of a pineapple aroma. Um, and, you know, you can actually use that. This is pineapple weed flan, you guys. Oh my gosh, right? Can you imagine a beautiful flan that's scented with pineapple? Oh, beautiful. And that same flan would actually be relaxing. You could eat it from before bed. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> I want that flan. <laughs> Um, so uh, pineapple weed, just wonderful uh, tea, incorporate it, mix it with your blue vervain maybe uh, for some relaxation and centering, mix it with your um, wild hops uh, uh, so that you can, you know, have a really good relaxing night of sleep, wonderful and so safe. Um, this is cleavers. It's a really common plant that a lot of you might have found in your gardens and you might find it super frustrating. I once had a friend say, I can't believe that cleavers is edible and medicinal because she could literally 
scoop up an entire armful because it was so common in her um, flower beds. It had actually taken over and it's very sticky. Another English name for it is sticky willy because the um, cleavers are, the plant is so sticky. You can see those fun sticky little hairs all over it in the bottom left hand picture and it'll actually the reason they're called cleavers is because it will cleave to your clothing um but cleavers are an amazing medicine and in particular um uh i've found that for women of color who are experiencing um an underactive or overactive thyroid like for thyroid issues Cleavers help to regulate thyroid function. So if you start using cleaver leaf oil in the exact same way that I told you, you know, put a cup of um, cleavers into a crock pot, pour two cups of olive oil over the top, let it sit overnight and strain it in the morning. Um, that cleaver leaf oil, like you see in the bottom right hand corner there, is wonderful for regulating thyroid function. And you can use that one fairly often. You could use it three to five times a day, every day, just six to 10 drops at a time to regulate thyroid function. And, and I have found, especially among indigenous women, that an under or overactive thyroid is uh, very, very common. Um, and you know that that's true um, in general for women of color, but you know it's become a really big issue. Uh, if, if any of you have been you know diagnosed with Hashimoto's, you know any of those um, thyroid uh, those issues that affect your thyroid, start incorporating some cleaver leaf oil into your life, and you'll see some benefits from it. Okay, all right. So I'm going to cover one more. This is my most favorite plant to have around. Um, this is nettles, otherwise known as stinging nettles. Um, as an ethnobotanist, I get asked all the time, if you could only have one plant in your life, what would it be? Or if you could only take one plant to the moon with you, what would it be? And it, unequivocally, my answer is nettles. Um, it's such an unassuming looking plant. It, um, you know, is, it doesn't get showy flowers or anything like that, but it just has such a multitude of amazing uses. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's great for thinning hair. So if any of you have been um, having issues with uh, uh, thinning hair, um, uh, we always say, um, you know, a, a lot of indigenous people say that after you have a baby, sometimes they take some of your hair uh, for their own. And um, <laughs> basically what that means is, you know, our, our hair starts to thin sometimes after we have children, maybe if we're going through menopause, um, incorporating uh, nettle into your shampoos or finding a shampoo that has nettle in it can actually really help to regrow your hair. Um, I just put this one down as an example. Uh, this pine tar and nettle soap um, is actually a shampoo bar. Um, there's also a beautiful indigenous owned, uh, Lakota owned company called Ha'i Pajaja Pejuta. And I promise um, that I will spell that for you guys uh, when, when I'm meeting with you in person um, so that you can have access to it. But they have a gorgeous uh, nettle shampoo bar um, that uh, has actually been shown to help regrow hair. So nettles are wonderful for your hair. They're wonderful for, um, uh, for people who have any type of inflammation, whether it's arthritis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, whether your sinuses are inflamed due to allergies, uh, nettles are your friend. Um, now they do come by their name very honestly. If any of you have ever come in contact with nettles in person, you know that they really do sting. In this top left-hand photo, you might be able to kind of see some of those stinging hairs along the stem. And um, those actually, uh, we were always taught that if you pick nettles barehanded, you'll never get arthritis as you get older. Just allow them to sting you and the sting will only last about, you know, 15 minutes or so for most people. Um, and you might get, you know, some of those little raised bumps on your hands, but we call that a medicine delivery system. And it's 
wonderful for you know any kind of swelling. You can use it on your knees or your hips. Um, I played a lot of sports when I was young, and any time that my knees start to hurt, I'll actually put on a pair of shorts and go run through a nettle patch, um, and I'll be pain free for weeks. So uh, nettles are wonderful. You can also use them internally. Now, as a tea, um, as you can see, that's a beautiful nettle pesto in the top right hand photo. Um, why would you want to eat something that stings you? Well, with any cooking or drying or quick blanching, um, all the stinging effect goes away. So you can absolutely eat young nettles. I prefer them at the stage in the bottom right hand corner um, when they're nice and tender and delicious um, and they make the perfect pesto. Uh, I put them into, I stuff them into ravioli with some ricotta. Uh, you can, you know, just do all kinds of things with nettle. You can even throw them into soups. And that's actually a very common soup in Europe um, uh, to have a beautiful, um, you know, uh, spring tonic. Um, they make nettle soup right? That helps to clear their system. It's just, you know, an absolutely wonderful plant to have around. Um, beautiful medicine, beautiful food. So um, yeah, that's a, another great one to have around that I hope you guys will all uh, check out. Well, I'm going to stop my share here um, so that I can say to you all that I'm so honored that you've joined me today. I hope you got a little bit of information out of this talk. Um, you know, I know that I shared a lot of plants with you. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to contact me by email. You can find me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm always happy to answer your questions about any of these plants, about how to make the perfect cup of tea, um, or, or I can, you know, hopefully answer some of your questions after this talk. Thank you guys so much, Wopila, for joining me and have a really great day. <laughs>